Neither. The next item of business is debate on motion 14521 in the name of Alison Harris on early years. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Alison Harris to speak to and move the motion for up to eight minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Scottish Conservatives are pleased to bring this debate to Parliament today, and I'll start by moving the motion in my name. The motion addresses a very few serious points which have thus far been ignored by the Scottish Government. I'm hoping that we can reach cross-party agreement today and to send a signal to all the hard-working childcare partnerships throughout Scotland that their concerns will be addressed. Four years ago, the SNP pledged to almost double childcare provision from the 600 hours to the 1140 a year by August 2020 for all three and four year olds and some eligible two year olds. Quite the headline, but one question lingered, how would this be achieved? It is clear that there has been a distinct lack of planning involved in following through on this promise and it is left to continue at its current pace, then the 2020 target will not be met. In fact, the level of provision will likely decrease going forward. Almost half of the nurseries say they are unlikely to meet the target of 1140 hours, with many pointing to underfunding as a significant barrier to doing so. This has been echoed by Audit Scotland, who in their recent report on the expansion of childcare highlighted a staggering black hole of 160 million a year in the policy's funding. The motion focuses on one of the main reasons this policy is failing, and that's the lack of inclusion of the private sector, despite the constant assurances by the minister that they are valued partners. There are over 6,000 private childcare providers in Scotland. They play a huge part in developing Scotland's children yet they're being swept aside. I've met with several partnerships and local authorities and one theme has been prevalent. There is a total lack of consistency and understanding in the rollout of the 1140 hours policy across local authorities. These issues faced by private providers can be boiled down to three major problem areas. The revenue funding rates across local authorities, the catastrophic sta staffing drain, and the lack of access to capital funding for private providers. As it stands, there is no standard hourly rate of funding across Scotland, meaning private providers and some local authorities receive significantly less than those in other local authorities. Private providers are receiving varying rates across councils from £3.75 to £4.50 to £5.31. A material variation and a total lack of consistency. And one thing that I would like to make clear here is that the private sector nurseries are not big multinational cooperations. They are usually small, independent organisations with very tight profit margins. When operating at such a level, the slightest change in external factors can lead to difficult business decisions needing to be made. This lack of top-line funding is preventing private nurseries from being able to pay many of their staff even the living wage. The impact of this is that local authorities are able to attract staff currently working in private nurseries to work for more money and fewer hours. This has a devastating impact on private providers, causing a mass exodus of their sta childcare staff, which will ultimately affect the delivery of high quality childcare in the long run. This is the reason the Scottish Conservatives will be supporting the amendment by Mary Fee, because the staffing problem is a huge thorn in the side of the feasibility of this policy in delivering good quality childcare for children across Scotland. I now turn to the third and possibly the most avoidable problem facing private providers, the lack of access to capital funding. Capital funding is supposed to be available to all childcare providers, but many private providers I have met with have noted with frustration that local authorities are denying them access to funding and instead almost exclusively awarding it to their own council-run nurseries without even considering private partnerships. Worse than that, there is confusion in several local authorities regarding whether or not private providers are actually entitled to receive capital funding. 
I spoke with representatives from one authority yesterday who were quite indignant at the idea of private providers expecting to receive capital funding. And another local authority who basically said, oh no, you're not entitled to that. This can be cleared up today. So I'm asking the minister whether she will write to each and every local authority to make clear the correct position regarding access to capital funding. And I'm happy to give way now to the Minister if she will confirm here that that is what she will do. Thank you. Marie Todd. Thank you. I'm more than happy to write and clarify the position. There is an issue around um, state aid in terms of local authorities providing capital funding direct to private businesses. But some, one local authority in particular, Angus, has found a way around that and is providing um, capital grants funding. And that is something that we are sharing throughout the country. That learning is something that we are sharing throughout the country through the Partnership Forum. If um, you would like me to write out to all the local authorities and explain that situation, I'm more than happy to do so. Alison Harris. Sorry. Yeah, I thank the Minister for that response. And yes, I would like you to do that straight away, please, because there is confusion. And the fact that you're mentioning one local authority, when there are numerous local authorities out there, actually is indicative that the government and indeed the government and indeed the SNP's indifference to the scale of the problem and the apparent inability to take on board what everyone is saying. Talk of partnership and engagement has been plenty, but these are warm words which are worryingly hollow. And I worry that the lack of understanding of the true partnership required between local authorities and private providers is preventing any meaningful progress from ever being made. If the expansion is going to succeed, this needs to change and it needs to change now. While there is obviously cross-party support for the 1140 hours target, I think we have to take a sensible, practical approach to expanding childcare. In the current day and age, flexibility is the number one childcare concern for many parents. 90% of council nurseries do not provide full working day childcare places. And almost none of them offer places starting before eight in the morning or lasting until after quarter past five in the evening. Unfortunately, this is just not adequate with parents and carers working outside of the available time windows. As it stands, many parents will be unable to access their full entitlement due to full-time work commitments. Often it is the private providers who are able to offer more flexible hours. But if the partnerships continues to break down, they will go out of business and that flexibility will actually disappear going forward. Presiding officer, I'm hoping that all parties in this chamber will support the motion and Labour's amendment today because we all want Scotland to have a successful childcare system. We are all behind the 11.40 hours. However, unfortunately, since the big headline announcement four years ago, the Scottish Government's implementation has been poorly planned, staggeringly unclear and damaging to children, parents and nurseries throughout Scotland. Thank you. I call Marie Todd to speak to and move Amendment 14521.2 for up to six minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. From August 2020, all three and four-year-olds and eligible two-year-olds will be entitled to 1140 hours of high-quality early learning and childcare. Thousands of children in our most challenged communities are already benefiting from early phasing. This is a truly transformative programme which has the potential to improve children's outcomes and to make a significant contribution to closing the poverty-related attainment gap. Quality sits front and centre of our vision. Throughout this debate, we must remember that children are at the heart of this expansion. That should be a powerful motivation for us all to work collaboratively to overcome the challenges inherent in such an ambitious reform programme. We know that high quality provision exists right across the public, private and third sectors. And we know that provision can take many forms, including nurseries, forest kindergartens, playgroups, children and family centres, specialist voluntary settings, outdoor settings and childminding services. Funding follows the child empowers parents to choose the provider that best meets the needs of their child. 
so long as that provider meets a new national standard and has a place available. Yes, I'm happy. Liz Smith. Uh, could I thank the Minister very much for taking the intervention? I totally accept the aims and ambitions of what the Scottish Government is saying, but will the Minister recognise that there is one sector here who feel very disadvantaged in trying to promote the policy that the Scottish Government has set out for exactly the reasons that Alison Harris set out in her speech? And it's that problem that we need to address because unless we have a fully engaged private sector that feels very ambitious, we are not going to succeed. Marie Todd. Indeed, and let me re reiterate again that it's this government's view that the, the private sector will be absolutely crucial to our delivery of this ambition. I'll update Parliament later this year on the final standard, which will be informed by the views of hundreds and hundreds of providers that we have engaged with during our joint consultation with COSLA. The standard levels the playing field between local authority, private and third sector providers. All providers have to meet the same quality driven criteria. There'll be an end to locally set requirements to enter partnership and an end to the capping of funded places in private nurseries. The national standard delivers one of the most important elements of this expansion pro programme to ensure that all childcare staff delivering children's funded entitlement are paid the real living wage. This initiative, which will raise the incomes of thousands of low paid workers, the vast majority of them women, will ensure that we properly value the contribution that our early years professionals make to shaping the lives of our youngest children. All members in the chamber should welcome this investment. Yes. Daniel Johnson. I thank the Minister for giving way. She rightly talks about the importance of standards and she rightly talks about the necessity of paying people the real living wage. But when the NDNA are saying that per child per hour, that their providers are in deficit to two, uh, two pounds per hour per child, how does that square? Are they wrong in their calculations or is there a funding gap? Marie Todd. The funding deal that we reached with COSLA in April secures the money required to ensure the delivery of the living wage commitment. The landmark £1 billion package, which is protected for investment in early learning and childcare, will deliver sustainable rates for all providers from 2020. The hourly rate paid to providers right across the country will increase significantly. It's worth putting on the record today that COSLA is fully behind a provider neutral approach, which puts quality first. However, both myself and Councillor Stephen McCabe, my counterpart in COSLA, recognise that more needs to be done to ensure that local cultures and systems fully realise our shared vision for a provider-neutral, quality-first approach. I have to commend to the Parliament the partnership working principles adopted by COSLA's Children and Young People Board in September. And these will be embedded in every single part of Scotland and were developed in consultation with the NDNA. I've already heard that these principles are driving improved relationships around the country. We've established the ELC Partnership Forum. This brings providers from all sectors and their representative bodies together with local authorities, COSLA and Scottish Government to work together to identify solutions to common challenges. It is early days. The forum met for the first time last week, but it's absolutely clear from the update that Councillor McCabe and I received at the ELC Joint Delivery Board meeting this morning that a spirit of joint endeavour is already radiating from the forum. We have both committed to attend the forum if needed to help to resolve any significant issues which may arise. We'll also ensure transparency in the reporting of local authority progress data reviewed by the Joint Delivery Board this morning so that local authorities are truly accountable for the local implementation of funding follows the child. Yes, certainly. I, I thank the Liz Minister. Smith, but quickly. Thank you for that second uh, taking the intervention. Could you just clarify, particularly in light of what some of her uh, high-profile MSP colleagues in the SNP have said, the concern, however, is that far too many local authorities are not engaging with that partnership working. Does she agree with that? Marie Todd, again quickly, please. I, I, I would not agree that that's the case throughout the country. I will absolutely agree that there are pockets of really um, troublesome, difficult, challenging partnership relationship. But I would say that across the country, there's actually a very positive party to be made, um, positive um, position to report. 
We know that there's good practice out there. The Partnership Forum heard last week about actions being taken in Angus, Edinburgh and Murray that result in meaningful partnership and providers feeling genuinely valued. Let me assure the providers who are currently experiencing strained relationships with their local authorities that meaningful partnership can exist. It does exist and Councillor McCabe and myself will work tirelessly to ensure that it exists in every single part of Scotland. This government's absolutely determined that we will support providers in the transition to 2020. We've already acted. We introduced the 100% non-domestic rate relief for private properties. Um, and we estimate that that relief will remove the burden of rates from up to 500 businesses. This year's programme for government also commits us to delivering yeah, a su delivering have to support come to package. Close, please. We've heard providers' concerns about sustainability, about relationship difficulties, about workforce challenges, and the need to communicate clearly with parents and families. These will all be addressed in our support package, which we'll launch before Christmas. I call on the Parliament to recognise the commitment from the Scottish Government and from COSLA to work tirelessly to provide support to providers from all sectors. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, the Minister has just moved the amendment. Thank you very much. Uh, I now call on Mary Fee to speak to her and move amendment 14521.1. Five minutes, please, Ms Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I begin by thanking Alison Harris for tabling this motion for debate today? Childcare is an important issue which impacts on the lives of thousands, and family, thousands of families up and down the country every day. Scottish Labour believe that childcare should be flexible, affordable and of high quality. And we support the extension of childcare provision to 11.43 11 hours per year for all three and four year olds and vulnerable two year olds. And the debate today provides us with an opportunity to assess how the expansion is being delivered and assess the working relationship between central government, local government and private nursery providers. And presiding officer, the, the current childcare system is disjointed and inflexible. No one would design a system from scratch that would look like that today, and it is an urgent need of reform. However, the mix of childcare providers we have today is essential to deliver the extension to 11.40 hours. Private nursery providers fill a massive gap that council-run providers cannot meet, and that's why it's crucial there are better working relations between government and private providers. And the Tory motion today recognises that and justifiably highlights the concerns of private nursery providers. And Scottish Labour will be supporting the motion in Alison Harris's name today and urge support for our amendment, which adds to the motion to raise concerns about staffing to meet that expansion. And presiding officer, so far this year, I have twice asked the minister how many staff are in place now for that expansion. And on both occasions, the minister could not answer. And I would be happy to give way to the minister today if she would care to update the chamber on the exact number of staff in the system today. Minister. There are 34,500 staff working in early learning and childcare across Scotland, 25,500 of them working, providing funded placements. Mary Fee. Can I thank the Minister for that clarification? We know that 11,000 childcare workers are needed by 2020. Can the Minister now tell us how close the Scottish Government is? And I, and I appreciate that the Minister has updated us, and I would also appreciate it if the Minister could keep us informed of how that, that progresses. Um, nursery providers, both private and public, need assurance that the right staffing resources will be available to deliver that policy. Private nurseries are telling us that staffing remains a significant problem for them, particularly around the competition of wages between private and public. One nursery owner has written to me to say, we appreciate the importance of paying the living wage, However, the current funding between council-run and private nurseries is not on a level playing field. We also hear that after staff complete training provided by a private nursery, they often leave to work in a council-run provider. The Scottish Government does need to ensure that a level playing field... Yes? 
So. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. I, I wonder if Mayfi would accept that the government, in the funding arrangements we've agreed with local authorities, entirely address that issue about the rates that have to be paid to enable private providers to pay the living wage. And that's part of the funding deal to deal with the expansion of early learning childcare and an implicit part of the agreement that we've reached. Mary Fee. Can I thank the, the Cabinet Secretary for that very helpful con contribution? Thank you and the clarification. Confidence in the private sector in delivering the policy is plummeting. That is evidence in the freedom of information responses which have been requested by the Conservatives. The Chief Executive of the National Day Nurseries Association has warned our members are very concerned that the current situation with funded childcare in Scotland means that they won't even survive to the expansion in 2020. The area manager of the Kirkton Home childcare chain, in writing to the Minister of Children and Young People, has warned the partner providers are literally on their knees and I believe this ambitious policy is about to implode. The NDNA also reports that only 30% of private nurseries are able to deliver the 1140 hours of free childcare. Whilst we support the extension of childcare to deliver for children and families, the Scottish Government must own up to the problems the policy faces and must get serious on delivering this policy in time. And, presiding officer, to repeat what I have already stated, the current childcare system is in urgent need of reform. Reform that is needed to benefit the mix of private and public providers and most importantly of all for families and children and I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. I call Tavish Scott to open for the Liberal Democrats. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Caught me slightly unawares there. Um, the, uh, I was looking to the green benches, but um, there we are. Um, the, uh, the, I, was about to, I was actually going to start with um, Archie, who's uh, grown, gone through his uh, preemptive years, having depended totally on uh, uh, private sector uh, childcare because his parents had the. Uh, his parents both work, one of whom has the temerity to live in Shetland quite a lot of the time, although he did redeem himself this summer, I am told, by taking him to Anfield for a pre-season uh, game. The point is that um, the dependence we placed as parents on the private sector was complete. Uh, and I want to reflect that in uh, recognising the government's ambitions uh, over the delivery uh, of and the expansion of uh, childcare is in that it is something that parents absolutely uh, want. Uh, but their approach, as the um, front benches for both Labour and the uh, and the Tories have rightly said this morning, uh, this afternoon rather, does need to adapt uh, and recognise the scale of challenges that exist uh, in all parts of Scotland, not just in some, but in all parts of Scotland. Uh, one childcare uh, provider uh, who is in the uh, private sector, absolutely essential in delivering in this particular area, um, wrote to me as such, uh, there is no doubt that private nurseries are the poor relation when it comes to an equitable distribution of the significant government funding to support the expansion of early years funded hours. Private nurseries are going to be squeezed as cash for capital works to improve local authority settings and to upscale their existing workforce takes place. Again, reflecting remarks that have been made by uh, colleagues in other, uh, on the other benches. The private sector will struggle, therefore, to retain their best staff due to the lure of a better paid council job. And private nurseries, therefore, in turn, face a double whammy of local authorities insisting that any support they get is dependent on demonstrating they are a living wage employer, uh, uh, whilst the hourly rate they pay to partner providers is below the operating cost threshold of the business. Now, I think those are um, serious and significant uh, concerns uh, that do need to be ironed out uh, by uh, the government uh, as they take this matter forward. If they don't, the concern is that uh, the, uh, the uh, hours that are going to be offered in nursery uh, places, the 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. slot, and that's what we're talking about here, the 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. slot, uh, suits, yes, some people, but most working mums and dads uh, either may st start before 9 o'clock in the morning and certainly finish uh, after 3 o'clock in the afternoon and that's why the other uh, parts of uh, service here uh, are going to have to pick up 
uh, those points, both before the start of what's broadly considered to be the normal working day uh, and very much uh, later into the evening as well. And in my part of the world as well, uh, there are a range of jobs that are way outside those hours uh, anyway. I know more people who, who work starting at 7 in the morning and finishing, uh, finishing at lunchtime and, and then uh, the other end of the day than I, as I do who work the traditional uh, hours of an office. Uh, and that, I think, is essential in understanding and therefore designing a system that takes into account uh, the challenges of the modern working world that we're in, whether you be in, whether you're, a t whether you're a teacher, whether you're a fish processor, whether you're in the hospitality industry, or whatever you happen to be in. And I recognise that's a huge challenge. I'm uh, not by no means am I diminishing or decrying the government's effort to get this right. But I do think that uh, the points that um, uh, that have been made already about, about tackling the challenge of that uh, landscape that, uh, that is the modern working world is essential in what is in, in the redesign, or if that's too strong, but certainly in the reconsideration of what is currently uh, not working. Now, I take Mary Fee's points and the question she was asking about the additional staff. There have been many gov government's own figures on this to illustrate the depths of the problems there. But one other point I might finish with, presiding officer, and that is, to, is for government to recognise what they're asking, in this case of local government but no doubt across the the entire range of organizations who are providing uh, child care highland council said just last month in order to satisfy the government that we are delivering this program of change they require of us planning monitoring tracking data gathering and financial reporting which is becoming more complex and detailed and i would ask the government also in responding to this debate to do to recognize there must be some happy balance somewhere between the necessity of auditing the use of public money uh, and dealing with the range uh, and uh, range of uh, reporting. Uh, yeah, but I'll, I'll happily give me when I finish this point. I'm sorry, the, the Cabinet Secretary will not be able to take intervention, but maybe in the closing remarks. Uh, in the range of reporting that is now being required often of businesses that have very few people indeed. Thank you very much. And apologies for not giving the member advance notice that he was about to be called there. Uh, there was no green speaker this afternoon. Uh, we're now going to be followed into the open debate. Brian Whittle to be followed by Rona Mackay. Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I do welcome the opportunity to contribute in, uh, in today's debate, which I believe is potentially one of the most important and far reaching pieces of legislation currently on the Scottish Government's books. 30 hours a week of free childcare should be a major tool in the drive to tackle health inequalities in that preventable health agenda. It's also an opportunity to help finally tackle that stubborn attainment gap before it even starts to open. So I think the goal must be to get all of our children to school age on as level playing field as possible, irrespective of background or personal circumstances. And I think furthermore, it's also a huge boost to those who want to get back into work following the birth of their child. So to start off, just to say that, that, that we in these benches are very supporters of the objectives of, of, of the Scottish Government in this piece of legislation. To achieve these laudable objectives and create that prerequisite number of quality childcare places will require partnership working between local authorities and private nursery providers. Now, I know the Minister has examples of where the attitude and approach from local councils is collaborative and reflects the way in which the Scottish Government has set out its delivery plan. However, Minister, the picture across the country of councils' relationship and treatment of partnership nursery care in many cases is far from this ideal. And I met with a number of partnership nurseries owners last week from across Scotland, and they have serious concerns as to their treatment and the sustainability within this scheme. And I don't have time to raise all their concerns, but here are some of the things they, they told me. They reported one council balloting, balloting for 20% of the places that should be available for partnership nursery places. Those successful in the ballot get 1,140 hours of free childcare at a rate of £5.31 per hour. Those unsuccessful, 80% of those who should be eligible, get 600 hours of free childcare at a rate of £3.43 an hour. Now, I'm pretty sure that's not what this policy was intended, eh, Minister. We, uh, I will, yes. Claire Adams. <clears throat> Would the member recognise that we are in the pilot stage of the delivery and that some of the mechanisms used that might not have been ideal, but it's 2020 we want to be delivering this out of the whole of the area. So uh, there was never going to be a situation where all, all nurses would be a bit be able to do the 11.40 at this stage in the pilot and recognise that there's been lessons learned from Briefly that too. Awesome. Brian Whittle. Thank you, presiding officer. I, I don't think, I, I thank you for your intervention. I think the people you need to speak to are the, the people that are in the gallery there that actually brought this to my attention. 2020 is going to be too late and I don't think balloting for places is the way forward. 
We have councils that are supplying 38 weeks of uh, a year, or, uh, 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 supplying 38 weeks of the year, having the audacity to ask the private providers to deliver on holiday cover. Not only is that grossly insulting, it is most definitely does not have the child's well-being at the centre of the policy. We have one council allocating all SIMD one to four places to, to the local authority, with his SIMD five and six going to private nurseries. Where's the parental choice in that? Why are, we why are we forcing those SIMD one to four children out of partnership nurseries they're already settled in? That council is taking out choice away and actually labelling children. Mm -hmm. I listen to stories of local authorities who have openly stated that they do not believe in partnership nursery childcare and they have no intention of working with them at all. They have, they're going to take all of their childcare in-house. Nurseries who have delivered decades of top quality care who have become an integral part of the community. Every nursery represented highlighted the issue of local authorities recruiting directly from the partnership nurseries into their local authority nurseries. They're losing so many of their highly trained staff and qualified staff that the care inspectorate are now downgrading them because of an increase in staff turnover. Deputy Presiding Officer, there are huge discrepancies between what the, the, the SNP government and the minister has asked local authorities to deliver and what they are delivering. There are local authorities who are consulting and treating partnership nurseries as, as a crucial part of scaling up of childcare in Scotland. However, as I've tried to highlight today, there are a significant number who are treating them in anything but partners. So can I ask the, the minister if she will meet with the partnership nurseries uh, uh, represented today in the gallery and listen to their concerns directly because, presiding officer, the minister and the government must get this right Aspiration is not enough without a proper plan and a continued audit of its implementation. Presenting officer. Thank you. I encourage all members to stick to four minutes if they can. Rona Mackay to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Thank you, presiding officer. There is no doubt that there is cross-party support for the transformation of free childcare to 11.40 hours. No one can argue that giving children the best quality early years education is a bad thing. The Scottish Government is delivering on its promise with a £1 billion multi-year funding package. This is an amazing commitment to children and families in Scotland and it heralds a new future for family life. Of course, a project of this size and complexity will not be plain sailing during the planning stages and I don't think anyone would reasonably expect it to be. And so there is presently a disconnect between some private care providers and some local authorities, as the government amendment recognises and as I have witnessed in my own constituency. So it's good that we're having uh, this debate in the chamber today. However, I do not believe there's been a lack of engagement from the Scottish government, as it says in the Conservative motion, but that the problem lies with how some local authorities are choosing to implement and ro the rollout. I've been visiting as many nurseries, both private and local authority, in my constituency as I can this year, and I've been approached by private providers and childminders about the 1140 rollout. I've also met with Eastern Barnshire Council to relay these concerns and to gain clarification on how their plans are progressing. Presiding officer, the passion and care from early years workers in all sectors that I have witnessed during my visits is amazing, and I cannot praise them highly enough. On Monday, the Education Committee hosted an Early Years Forum in Rutherglen, which included private Early Years providers, local authority uh, nursery workers and officers from a cross-section of authorities. What we heard there was that local authorities have individual ways of approaching the rollout, as one size doesn't fit all, depending on the needs of the area. But this, by its nature, does muddy the waters regarding planning and implementation. We heard from private providers that communication and partnership working is far from perfect, with one of the worst offenders being North Lanarkshire, although they were not alone. North Lanarkshire has, we were told, not consulted the private sector as equal partners and used the capital expenditure money for building new nurseries, contrary to Scottish Government guidelines which state clearly that councils need to look at how they maximise their own provision through their nurseries, how partners can expand to meet the demand of 1140 hours and only then look to build new nurseries. And I was pleased to hear the Minister say she would clarify this in an earlier answer. Uh, I also did hear uh, the, the incident that Brian Whittle uh, mentioned about uh, the Scottish Multiple Index of Deprivation and uh, children being, uh, sort of, families being dictated to, if you like. And, presiding officer, if this is correct, it goes against all the principles of parental choice and flexibility, which is one of the great strengths of the Scottish Government's commitment to this transformational policy. 
I, would, I find that quite shocking and I'd welcome the Minister's comments when closing on whether local authorities are being held to are being scrutinised by the government on how they're implementing the rollout and how the money has been spent. We did hear private, from private providers that, while happy to pay the living wage, they have, a funding allocation, they have funding allocation concerns, which is leading to an exodus of trained staff moving to local authorities, and that childminders have, in some areas, been sidelined, despite being a major part of the blended model of childcare which should be offered to parents. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, it's impossible to address all these issues in a four-minute speech, but I believe the government will work with local authorities to address these problems and make this hugely important initiative work. We will learn from good practice, such as has been happening in Angus, Morrie and Edinburgh, and failure is not an option here. We need to show that we're listening and will act on the concerns being raised without delay. Because the bottom line is this transformational policy will bring phenomenal benefits and huge opportunities for children and families throughout Scotland. By working together, I'm confident that we can and will make it happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Daniel Johnson to be followed by Gordon MacDonald. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm not sure whether I should begin my remarks by making a declaration of interest or people can take it as read from the food stains on my suit that I picked up a three-year-old this morning to take her to her funded place. But the reality is, is that I am only, only too aware of just how important quality childcare is. And I truly believe that is something that should be made available to everyone, regardless of where they live or whether or not they can afford it. That's why this commitment is important. That's why this debate is important. Because we are a mere matter of months away from the point that this target that the Scottish Government has set is supposed to be uh, met. And the reality is, and I think as Alison Harris pointed out in her introductory remarks, this isn't important just because it's a government uh, target or a government commitment, because doing this in, a, uh, 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 in the wrong way actually has the very real uh, possibility of making things worse, of removing provision. That's why this debate is important. And to recognise... Briefly, yes. Thank you, Whittle. I thank Daniel Johnson for taking his intervention. Would you agree with me that one of the downsides of getting this wrong will be uh, taking uh, childcare away from the zero to three year old? Daniel Johnson. Um, I thank the member for that intervention. I think that's exactly right because you only have to look at the reality of the 600 hours to realise the consequences and the things that nurseries have to do to make that work to realise why this is a problem. Because if you talk to nurseries and you talk about the reality of the 600 hours, the first thing they'll say to you is this. Don't call them free hours. They're funded hours. And that's the, because the reality of the 600 hours is that nurseries are having to top up. They're having to find ways of cross-subsidising that provision. That's the reality of the £2 deficit per hour per child that the NDNA has identified. And as Brian Whittle pointed out, the reality is, is as you increase to 1140 hours, if those places are insufficiently funded, you, with that wiggle room removed, you are undermining those, uh, those nurseries' ability uh, to, to operate at all because it's a much greater proportion of theirs and their ability to cross-subsidise is reduced. That's just a fundamental uh, point in, in operation. And it's also we need to look and be realistic about what parents need. Parents need up to 2,000 hours a year. They need eight to six provision and they need that flexibility so that they can work. And that is why fundamentally partnership providers are needed because that flexibility is just not there within local authority provision. Within the local authority sector, only 68% six, uh, of that provision uh, currently provides only half days. Less than half of local authorities can provide lunch. And in total, less than 3% of local authorities right now can provide full-time year-round, not just within school term, but year-round childcare. Now, that's not the fault of those providers. That is because that is based on a model about supplementing schools. But what we are needing is holistic, flexible childcare. And that is why we need partnership providers. So the findings from the NDNA that 46% uh, um, of brides are not going to uh, offer 1140 hours, that only 7% could have provided 1140 hours on the basis of current uh, funding. And those that are looking at providing 53% will need top-ups in order to supplement. Surely that should sound alarm bells about the insufficiency of the funding that's being talked about. 
And while that funding may be increased on current levels, it is simply not enough to make up the £2 an hour per child deficit. So the, the, the consequences and the implications of this, the, the Scottish Government has a mere matter of months to get this right, a mere matter of months to build the buildings that need built, to train the, the people that need to be trained, and fundamentally to get a funding package right so that the 1140 hours can be extended and doesn't end up removing childcare provision and capacity rather than increasing it. Thank you. I call Gordon MacDonald to be followed by Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the policy of improving early learning and childcare by moving from early years provision of 600 hours to 1,140 hours is both ambitious and challenging. There is a need to increase the number of qualified staff, increase building capacity and ensure that either local authorities, private nurseries or childminders will deliver the number of places required. As a member of the Education Committee, uh, like Rona Mackay, I attended Rutherglen Town Hall this week, where I took part in the focus groups discussing the introduction of the 1140 hours of funded childcare by August 2020. We discussed the issues with local authority representatives, private nursery providers and childminders. The major concern they all raised related to staff retention. We are in a transition period as we move towards full implementation. Therefore, not all providers have moved over to the 1140 hours provision, and that is causing problems. As providers move over to the new contract, their hourly rate increases. For example, in Edinburgh, those providers on 600 hour contracts receive £3.80 from August of this year, but those on 1140 contracts are in receipt of £5.31 per hour. The result is that providers on the new contract are able to offer higher salaries, making it difficult for those on the 600 hours contract to retain their staff. I've only got four minutes. I'm aware that the Scottish staffing levels are being addressed, and I am aware that the Scottish Funding Council in 2018-19 had a further increase in the number of childcare training places, delivering 1,500 additional places on HNC courses and over 400 additional graduate level places. However, this staff retention problem will remain until enough newly trained staff are in place and all providers are on the 1140-hour contract. In relation to building capacity, we heard that many local authorities are examining how they use their existing nursery school estate and whether they can better utilise the building in order that they can open from 8am to 6pm in Edinburgh Thanks to a capital grant from the Scottish Government of £40 million, the Council has an expansion plan that will see many of the school nursery provisions refurbished or rebuilt, including Dean Park, Canal View and Clovenstone in my constituency, who will undergo refurbishment, and Nether Curry in St Mark's that will have new build nurseries in 2019-20. Of course, private nurseries in Edinburgh's who plan to move over to the new contract can budget for a substantial increase in funding and with 100% rates relief for day nurseries in place and the possibility of receiving a capital grant, then businesses are able to put together a business plan to grow their own nursery provision. Since, since August 2017, 25 council-run nurseries in Edinburgh have been providing 1,140 hours of early years childcare. And in phase two from August 2018, 38 local authority nurseries will offer up to 2,520 places. That represents nearly a quarter of the 11,000 three and four year olds and eligible two year olds who currently receive 600 hours of funded childcare who are now already on the 30 week provision, 30 hour a week provision. Yes, there are issues that we need to address but we should remember that the primary aim of this policy is to improve outcomes for all children and to close the attainment gap. The secondary aim is to support parents back into work, training or study that in the long term will help family budgets. I'm sure the policy intention is something that we can all support and we need all to work together to ensure that we can deliver it for all of Scotland's children. Thank you, I call Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Joan McAlpine. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. We all want our children to have the best start in life, and this could not be more important when it comes to quality and choice of childcare. Could I use this opportunity, Presiding Officer, to welcome the private providers to the gallery today? The Scottish Government has expanded the number of entitled hours of childcare over the years, which has been a positive and welcome step to help more parents return to work. However, we know that the latest expansion attempt has been severely hampered by the poor planning and lack of preparation for the rollout from this government. Audit Scotland warned back in February this year that there were significant risks to the expansion. If we do not address and discuss these issues as we are today, they will continue to rumble on in the background, severely damaging the viability of and sustainability of private childcare providers. I want to use the short time that I have to concentrate on a couple of issues um, and problems that are being faced by the private providers. They're having to compete often unfairly with the state sector. Some of the pro problems also include lack of engagement with the local authorities across Scotland, not just only in my constituency, a lack of access to the capital funding, as we've heard from Alison Harris, um, funding uncertainty and increased competition from public nurseries, who should be complementing, not inhibiting the existing pro private providers. We need private nurseries to survive and thrive to deliver this expansion, not to shut their doors because they cannot compete. This is about choice for parents to be able to choose the best quality care setting for the child. Um, the example I want to give um, was actually about a private provider um, who was concerned that they had to make a staff member uh, redundant this week um, due to losing three children uh, in the nursery. And I was told the reason the children left is because um, they're registered with school nursery from January, the term after their third birthdays. And if school nurseries have places, then they let the children start as close to the child's third birthday as possible. And I'd like to quote um, the provider. The council's answer to this is that if we have space and staffing, then we can follow the same rule and let the children start their funded place as close to their third birth birthday as we can. But the crux is that we won't be paid by the council for those places until the January or the April, depending on when their birthday falls. In this situation, those children were due to leave in January, and it's not feasible to fund them from the business in the way the school will until January. And as they were leaving anyway, to give them free hours just doesn't make sense. But the nursery will have planned for them leaving in January. And what's happened is that they've been poached for an early start at school nursery. And it leads to a shortfall in expected funds. And so sadly, a staff member has lost their job. On this point, I would like to hear in summing up from the minister um, the response to the lack of flexibility for partnership providers and fairness um, of choice for parents. We hear constant assurances from the Minister that the private sector is valued partner, but evidence suggests that they are not. Another um, problem that private providers are facing, and I quote, is a lack of consistency over hourly rates. And the hub school at Chernside, for example, is charging £3.20 per hour for wraparound in their nursery, which is open for 50 weeks a year. The plan is for there to be a hub school nursery in every town with a high school. So for us, we'll be competing with the local schools from August 2019 for year-round children. If they're charging £3.20 per hour for their wraparound versus our £4.70 per hour, and many private nurseries, by the way, are charging over £5, then it looks like we can't compete with that level of undercutting. On this point, clarity and consistency is needed. And again, if the Scottish Government are to be believed, they value the role of private providers. Perhaps listening to their concerns and acting upon them would be very helpful. Lastly, on the problems that they're facing, staff retention is proving to be increasingly large pro uh, problem, and we've heard examples of that today. So I won't go into those specifically. However, presiding officer, this simply cannot continue. The Scottish Conservatives want early learning and childcare to be a true partnership between local authorities and the private sector. And I urge all members across the chamber to support our motion without question. This is an untenable scenario and must be addressed urgently. Thank you. I call Joe McAlpine and then we'll go to Ian Gray's to first the closing speeches. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think what the Chamber needs is a little positivity. We, we shouldn't forget that the SNP Government's commitment to double the number of hours of free nursery education is the most ambitious expansion of funded early learning and childcare that this country has ever seen, bar none. 
doubling provision is a huge investment in terms of social infrastructure as well as bricks and mortar and by 2021 as we've heard the annual revenue investment in early years will be almost a billion pounds a phenomenal sum and, and by that time 11,000 workers will have been employed additional workers that is I am aware of the concerns that some in the private uh, and third sector have expressed. Indeed, I, I've heard them at first hand uh, in my constituency. One excellent example in my own area is Sparklers Nurseries in, Nursery in Gretna and Annan, an excellent facility that has won several awards, in, including for staff development, and which offers everything that a local authority can offer, and including, in additionally, uh, the wraparound care that, that we've heard about before, the flexibility. Uh, now, I know that um, providers like Sparklers have raised in the past with me uh, that they weren't involved in the planning of services and they were frustrated that councils were expanding their own provision in areas where good quality private sector providers already operated. Um, and I sympathise, not least because these businesses were founded and built up by female entrepreneurs. Uh, and that's why I really welcome uh, the assurances by the Minister today uh, that she has been listening uh, to these providers and that the agreement reached in, in, in April is just at the early stage and that there's a rollout of more money and, um, and that their concerns will be taken on board. And, it's very clear that the government's track record here shows that they, like me, um, ha have been responding to, to the concerns, listening and responding, uh, not least in the 100% rates relief uh, that's been expanded to the uh, private sector providers, uh, and also the funding follows the child model that seeks to give parents a choice between a range of high quality providers, including childminders, uh, which is very important in my area because uh, many villages don't have a nursery, so it provides the kind of flexibility that we need in rural areas. Um, no, I don't have time, I'm sorry. The government has listened to the concerns of the National Day Nurseries Association and importantly is acting on those concerns. Um, we've heard um, the DNA asked for a better funding rate and the government has reached um, this agreement with COSLA, which amongst other things will enable all childcare workers uh, uh, to be paid the Scottish living wage at least by 2020. And I also want to make mention of the deposit guarantee scheme uh, which particularly helps the private sector and third sector providers uh, that we're discussing today. Thousands of parents no longer have to pay expensive upfront childcare deposits. In Edinburgh, Glasgow and in Fries and Galloway, the Scottish Government will cover that cost for er eligible families uh, until December 2019. And almost half of parents in the private areas with a child under two uh, taking up childcare for the first time can benefit from that. Um, I welcome also the establishment of the ELC Partnership Forum, uh, which will promote cooperation between local authorities and partner providers. And that's also been welcomed, of course, by the NDNA's Chief Executive. But I wanted to finish by saying this. Time and again in this chamber, the government is urged to work in partnership with local authorities and respect democratic local decision making. And I would say that in my experience, and also from what I've heard in the chamber today, that many of the difficulties outlined by private and third sector provided, providers are related to decisions made at council level, not uh, by the government. And you can't, on the one hand, tell the government that they should respect local democracy and then simultaneously demand that government blunderbuss councils who don't do as they're told. I think the government has offered constructive ways that encourage everyone uh, to work in partnership for the delivery of our ambitious early years commitment uh, and I hope that people take the government's lead in that and do work in partnership and collaborate together Conclude, for the good please, of please. Scotland's children because that at the end of the day is what this is all about. Thank you. Thank you very much. We move to closing speeches. The first from Ian Gray for the Labour Party. <coughs> Thanks very much, Presiding Officer. I suppose uh, this is one of those afternoons where the idle observer might think that perhaps we've managed to construct an argument uh, out of something that we all agree on. Because many, because many speakers have said, uh, uh, made the point that we do agree uh, that the move to 11.40 hours is a very welcome one. But the disagreement lies around the confidence in the measures which have been taken uh, and the measures the government are taking to actually deliver uh, this policy. And there is serious and significant evidence to fuel uh, those concerns. Firstly, 
We have very strong evidence of the concerns from those critical partner providers, the private nursery sector. We also have uh, the report from Audit Scotland earlier this year. But we also have the experience of the previous policy commitment of 600 uh, funded hours. And we know that even although that policy has been in place for many years now, that there are still many families who actually find it quite difficult to access their entitlement. Fair funding for kids, the campaign, have told us for months and years now of the lack of flexibility in the sector. Something like half of all nurseries, private or council, providing only half days. 90% uh, of uh, council nurseries only providing provision in term time. 19 local authority areas where no council nursery opens from 8 till 6 at all. Cross-border problems for those who want to place their uh, children in a different authority from the one they live in. All of these problems still remain in the previous policy and that's why uh, some of those uh, who are involved in uh, providing childcare lack confidence in the new policy being brought forward properly and in time. And uh, the Minister was uh, very strong in her commitment to uh, this policy being about closing the attainment gap and helping to address poverty, and that's very welcome. But it is the case in the current 600 funded hours, less than half of those vulnerable two-year-olds who have an entitlement have actually been able to take that entitlement up. It is those very children uh, that the current policy has failed. Audit Scotland comments on all of that in their report, but they also make clear that they do not believe that the 1140 policy is going to be delivered in time. They say that planning started too late, uh, that there is a difference of view in the finances that are available, uh, and uh, although the report came out before the agreement with COSLA, the evidence which Audit Scotland gave to the committee did take account of that, and they also say that they cannot see uh, how the 11,000 additional workers in the workforce are going to be found. And they take account of the measures which the government have introduced, the additional apprenticeship places and so on, but they still can't see how that's going to work. But the strongest concerns, uh, and this has dominated the short debate we've had uh, this afternoon, are those of those partner providers. Funding shortfalls, uh, the, 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 the pressure of paying the national living wage, and... I, I heard Mr. Swinney make the point. No, I, I heard you make the point, Mr. Swinney, uh, that the agreement mm -hmm. uh, means that there should be enough funding for the funded hours to allow them to pay the living wage. But at the moment, only 3% of private nursery providers are accredited living wage uh, employers. So we have a very, very long way to go. And they are not, well, I don't have time, I'm sorry. They are not convinced uh, that they will, in fact, be able to do this. And that's why two-thirds of them are saying they won't engage with the 1140 funded hours at all. That's a serious position. Uh, and I know that the minister says it's been sorted. I know that she says that, what was it, a spirit of joint endeavour is radiating from the early years forum. Mm -hmm. Minister, those partner providers are not feeling bathed in the warmth of that spirit of joint <laughs> endeavour. They are seriously concerned, and we need to hear from you what more you're going to do to convince them this is going to work. Thank you. And I call the Minister Marie Todd to conclude for the Government. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The debate today has largely been focused on governance, and in closing, I aim to provide the reassurance that my colleagues seek. We have the right and robust governance mechanisms in place. We've established a joint delivery board, which um, is... is, is Councillor Stephen McCabe and myself co-chair. It also has representatives on it from ADIS, from SOLAS and from directors of finance. So the people seeking data um, to, ensure, to assure ourselves that this is being um, delivered appropriately are not the Scottish Government. It is very much a joint endeavour. The board met earlier today in Greenock where we discussed the first set of progress data I received from the local authorities and we had an update on the meeting in the partnership for forum. The board monitors workforce uptake capacity and infrastructure and I'm pleased to report that all are largely on target. We can identify where there are challenges and we are ensuring that action is being taken to address those challenges quickly. 
I want to assure the Chamber that we're also monitoring quality. We are determined to ensure that quality is maintained during this expansion. We plan to publish this information regularly to ensure that there's transparency over how the expansion is progressing, starting with the first data set in the next few weeks. We heard a report from the Partnership Forum today and it reaffirmed our commitment. We reaffirmed our commitment to attend if required. We will work tirelessly to ensure that the pockets of excellent practice become standard right across Scotland. Let me reassure you that we haven't hand-picked quiet wallflowers for the Partnership Forum. There was really good representation there from right across Scotland and from different sectors. And I heard there was very robust challenge from many of the partner providers there, but it was an overwhelmingly positive meeting. The passion and the commitment that all of the parties feel for this expansion was palpable, as was the sense of everyone working together to the same end. I understand that there are private providers with concerns about their role in the expansion in some areas, and I hope I have provided reassurance in this regard. Our provider-neutral approach makes very clear that we value the role that private providers currently play now and will play in the future, and we know that there's more that can be done to improve engagement and involvement in the rollout of our expansion plans. Yes. Brian Whittle. Can I, can I thank the Minister for taking intervention and I appreciate uh, uh, her commitment to, the, to this programme, but can, can you say to the partnership nurseries that are behind me, they have said to me they feel that local authorities are setting themselves up in competition with partnership nurseries rather than that, that collaborative, collaborative working as equal partners. Yep. Minister. I can assure you that the local authorities currently, private providers and childminders together, provide 24% of the provision. And in 2021-22, local authorities expect them to also provide 24% of the provision. I'm hearing what members are saying about what's going on in their communities and in relation to particular situations and providers. I want to reassure that I've listened. I want to reassure you that my door is open. I'm very happy to meet with any member to discuss particular issues or concerns about providers. And Particularly, I want to hear about parents' and children's experiences. And while I accept that not everything is perfect in our rollout programme, not everything is bad either. I want to acknowledge that there is progress and what we are doing is already making a difference in communities and to families up and down the land. Certainly. Michelle Ballantyne. Can I ask you then, for, if you're saying very keenly that you want parents to be able to have choices, that the, you know, the money should follow them as well, can I ask then about the right to have your childcare, your free hours, outside of the area you live in? Because I've been contacted by a number of constituents who want childcare where they work, not where they live. Minister. Absolutely. Let me reassure you that that's um, not going to be a problem in the, more in, in the future. There will be absolutely no barrier to an out-of-area placement because, as I've explained many times in this chamber, the only requirement for a, um, a parent is that the funded partner is meeting the national quality standard and has a place available. The government remains absolutely committed to this most ambitious expansion of early learning childcare in the UK and we have fully funded it. I want to assure you that we're making good progress. At the meeting today, I was really, really pleased to hear from the data returns from local authorities, which is data that they are collecting anyway, it's no extra work for them to collect it, that more than a thousand two-year-olds right across the country are now already at the moment receiving more than 600 hours of funded entitlement. I am delighted that uptake for eligible twos is exceeding our forecast at this stage. Because of our policy decision to ensure that children who need it most benefit from this policy first, the first phase of the expansion was always going to involve local authority nurseries largely because they are the very nurseries which operate in areas of high deprivation. But I can assure conclude. you we remain committed to this provider-neutral report um, approach. Presiding officer, we are making really good progress on our plans to transform early learning and childcare for this and future generations of Scottish families. I acknowledge there's more we can do and I will ensure that we deliver on our aspirations and commitment. Thank you, and I call on Liz Smith to conclude the debate.
Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And uh, can I begin my speech by agreeing wholeheartedly with what Ian Gray said? I thought he was uh, setting out the context of the problem that we face. And can I can also say to the Minister that I entirely accept uh, your ambitions of what it is that you're trying to deliver and the efforts that you are making uh, to make that happen. But I think this debate is not just about the promises. It is about ensuring that we can put in place the ways in which we're going to deliver the policies that we all aspire to. And it is in, in very much in case that we have to make sure that we are complementing both sectors in the way that they provide the childcare that we need if we are to fulfill the policies. Because it is so important, Minister, that we listen. That we listen very, very, very carefully to the concerns that the private sector have set out. They were listed by my colleague uh, Brian Whittle. I thought uh, uh, Rona Mackay made a very good speech in terms of flagging up some of the concerns that she has heard in her own constituency. We know that Alex Neil and Kate Forbes, we even heard Joan McAlpine today uh, echoing some of the concerns that have been uh, put about by the Conservatives this afternoon. Th this is a very important debate in feeling that we can empower these uh, people within the private sect sector to allow us to deliver the policy requirements. And like any effective policy, that anything that the government uh, undertakes, there has to be a solid basis of evidence in front of us. And as Rachel Hamilton set out, and uh, both uh, Tavish Scott and Mary Fee referred to this, we cannot ignore what uh, was said by Audit Scotland and the Accounts Commission. We simply cannot ignore it because it was a very stark message about what has to happen if we are to fulfill uh, the policy. And I think it was Daniel Johnson who mentioned about the concerns that because of the 600 hours policy that we've actually not been able to move on significantly from that in a way that satisfies people that we have the confidence of parents and the ability uh, of the private sector to be able uh, to engage with that. Uh, th this is not just a debate about extending uh, the number of hours. This is a debate about the flexibility, it is about parental choice, and it is about ensuring that people within the private sector can engage with that. that that's what it's all about. And at the moment, the private sector is telling us that they do not feel that confidence. They don't have that uh, ability to be able to take on board a lot of the things that they would like to do to ensure that so many of our children would be able to have that uh, additional support. So I think that is something that we, we can't just talk about this. We've actually got to do something. And as I say, it's not just about the extra number of hours. It's not just about the financial commitment. This is about the flexibility and the structure uh, within the whole system. Because if we don't do something about that, then I think we are in danger uh, of, of not being able to carry forward what we want. Can I just finish my remarks, uh, presiding officer, on the fact that there are some examples, there are some good examples of local authorities uh, working on a partnership deal. But I have to say, Minister, the evidence shows that they are few and far between. And if we are going to be able to ensure that all local authorities have this partnership funding in the way that we would like, I'm afraid we are going to have to ensure that we take some drastic action to make that happen. Because the, in some cases, the state sector is pushing out the private sector. Now, that is just not acceptable in terms of being able to deliver the number of places. And I, I take on board, Minister, your um, determination to try to do something about this. But it is about clarifying. I, I, th I, I think I can't, Cabinet Secretary, on this occasion. Uh, Minister, it is about being able to clarify the advice that you are giving to local authorities. Because as Alison Hallis rightly said, we have got too many local authorities who are not actually abiding by the policy and therefore that is letting down uh, many of the people in the private sector. I'm aware of the time, presiding officer. This is an exceptionally important debate. We have no problems about the Scottish Government's ambition. What we do have a problem with, and I think many of the SNP have a problem as well, is about exactly how we deliver it. And we have to take on board the concerns that we're hearing from many people in that private sector. And thank you very much, Ms Smith. And that concludes our debate on the early years. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 14535 in the name of Graeme Day 
On behalf of the Bureau, setting up a business programme, uh, I would call on Graham Reid on behalf of the Bureau to move the motion. Move, presiding officer. Thank you very much. No one wishes to speak on this. I call on Graham Reid to respond. Uh, sorry, I call on the. Uh, sorry, the question is that motion 14535 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. We are agreed. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 14536 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau on a stage one timetable for a bill. Does anyone wish to speak against the motion? No one does. Uh, can I call on Graham Day to move the motion? Move, presiding officer. Thank you. The question is that motion 14536 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item is consideration of three parliamentary bureau motions. Could I call on Graham Day to move motions? 14537 and 14556 on designation of a lead committee and 14538 on office of the clerk. Uh, move, President officer. Thank you very much. Those questions will come at decision time and we're coming to that now. So the first question is that amendment 14520.4 in the name of Paul Wheelhouse, which seeks to amend motion 14520 in the name of Jamie Green on concern over the state of Scotland's ferry services be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 14520.4 in the name of Paul Wheelhouse is yes, 61, no, 62. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 14520.3 in the name of Colin Smith, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Jamie Green on Scotland's ferry services, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast the votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 14520.3 in the name of Colin Smith is yes 62, no 61. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. And the next question is that motion 14520 in the name of Jamie Green as amended on concern over the state of Scotland's ferry services be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. Now, the result of the vote on motion 14520 in the name of Jamie Green as amended is yes, 62, no, 62. There were no abstentions. And as Parliament has been unable to reach agreement on this, I'll use my casting vote against the motion. Therefore, the motion will not be carried. Now, the fourth question is that amendment 14521.2 in the name of Marie Todd which seeks to amend motion 14521 in the name of Alison Harrison, early years be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Are we agreed? Yes. No, we're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on amendment number 14521.2 in the name of Marie Todd is yes, 62, no, 62. There were no abstentions. Uh, the vote is tied, and therefore the Parliament has not reached agreement again. And in this case, I cast my vote against the amendment. The amendment is not carried. The fifth question is that Amendment 14521.1 in the name of Mary Fee, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Alison Harris, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Yes, we are all agreed. That is carried. The next question is that Motion 14521 in the name of Alison Harris, as amended, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 14521 in the name of Alison Harris as amended is yes 62, no 62. There were no abstentions. Again, Parliament has not agreed a position and I will use my casting vote against the motion, so the motion is not carried. The seventh question, I propose uh, putting all three business motions as a single question. Does anyone object? No one objects. Good. The question is that motions 14537, 14538 and 14556 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Hurrah. That concludes decision time. We'll move now to members' business. It's in the name of Joan McAlpine on restoring the Caledonian Pinewood Forest. And we'll just take a few moments for members and the Minister to change seats. <laughs> 